thank you everyone for coming. We're not sure whether our keynote speaker, Dr. Patanjali, is here. If he's not here, we'll just start with what we plan to have be a really informal session about a topic of great interest to us, which is incorporating research into our eye care programs and the role that NGOs have to play. Uh, it's my pleasure to first um, introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Gyan Prakash. He joins us from the National Eye Institute in Bethesda, where he's Associate Director of the Institute's Office of International Programs. He plays a key role in overseeing the Institute's uh, in international involvement in eye disease research and training. Uh, he previously held senior positions at MR International and Pfizer Pharmaceuticals International Division. He has uh, background as a PhD microbiologist and also postdoctoral training in biotechnology at University of California, Los Angeles, um, and in addition has studied at CDC and earned an MBA in pharmaceutical management. And he is quite the spark plug when it comes to encouraging people to incorporate research into their good practice so that we can work with evidence and not only anecdote. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gyan Prakash. Okay, uh, namaste to all of you. It's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. And Suzanne we cannot thank you enough, and I cannot thank you enough on, on, on a personal level. This, uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, we were actually standing here, and uh, we were talking about how this thing all came about. And I think looking at this audience, this is a informal enough audience, and our old friends, they are all like doers in this great country, great land, um, which I had the privilege of actually being born, and uh, uh, now we are bridging the gap between and bringing the best of both. My late father, who passed away about six years ago, one of the things that he used to go to America, and you know, and then he would, we would come here, and, and one of the things he would always tell uh, us, and the next generation, of course, that you know, you had the opportunity to bring the best of both. So I would dedicate this session to him because this has been kind of this, this in making. And uh, Dr. Suzanne Gilbert knows our children, and uh, she can relate to that. Uh, what an, and you know, and, and it's amazing that how things happen that uh, our uh, uh, previous generation passes, and then when something like this happens in life, you know, we think of them that oh, they said that, and this is what they meant. So clearly, the goal of this session. Uh, started out, or the, the theme of this session started out from a discussion that Suzanne G and I had um, about, I would say about three years ago, because, you know, her efforts and everyone else here, um, that, that, you know, folks from various NGOs uh, across the country, um, I've been interacting with uh, many of you over the years, and I've seen you actually do things and then leading into or entering into research field and the contribution that NGOs have made in, in, uh, in India. And then the next layer comes that, you know, so they made the ground fertile. Uh, uh, you know, the next generation of researchers come, they built the facility, which some of you have done very nicely. So I think it's, it's time to really get this going. So, uh, so let's start with this, that we, we are here um, and we'll, discuss things informally s and any question and anything else that whatever comes to your mind, please feel free to stop us and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. And we'll learn from each other. Okay, so this is just a disclaimer that uh, a lot of things that I said were very personal and many of you who know me, uh, you know my style that, you know, I speak from my heart uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and that's how we get things done. And earlier session was the last slide was that if you don't have any passion in your life, life is not worth living. So I'm very passionate about what the things that I do in international research. So I'm going to give you 
some of you know about uh, uh, National Institute of Health. How many of you have not heard of National Institutes of Health, National Eye Institute, sitting here in this audience? Okay, there are, there are a couple maybe, yeah, right here. So let's just quickly, uh, you know, refresh your memory here. Uh, this is the National Institute of Health campus. This is an agency of the U.S. government, just like yours, uh, in, you know, Indian Ministry of Health. We call it Department of Health and Human Services. And our main goal mandate is to conduct and support medical research uh, for discovering or for uncovering new knowledge and that improves the health of all Americans. But look at that, what it says right uh, after uh, that. I'm looking for the pointer here. Somewhere? Oh, great, great, thank you. Yeah. So look at this word here. It, uh, literally says, and the human condition throughout the world. So when people say, and I'm going to actually qualify this by telling you another, giving you another information, is uh, when people say, well, I mean, this is this research happening in, in America, American agency, uh, what do we have, uh, you know, what relations do I have with this uh, program? Um, the NIH programs are available to investigators and researchers around the world. Anyone living in, in this world can really literally apply for the programs as long as you follow this mandate that you uncover new knowledge for improving health of human beings, essentially. And I truly believe that anything that's being discovered here in Indore or Chitrakoot or uh, in Delhi or uh, anywhere in this country, uh, if you find something new, there's no reason why we living in America cannot use that information to really improve the life of uh, uh, people, whether they are live in America or anywhere else in the world. So anyways, you could find a lot more information about, you know, about this um, at our website. And uh, there are 27 institutions and centers within the NIH, and they are all dedicated either uh, uh, on uh, um, organ system basis or on uh, um, disease areas. So National Eye Institute happens to be one that's dedicated to really working or doing research or anything that relates to science on eye research. And our budget is approximately 800 million just for eye research. And it's not just the scientists who are working in our labs, but about 85% of the, that money, which is close to $650 million, folks, goes out to support research all over the world, not just America. So it's, a, it's, it's a just for eye research, so think about it. And uh, we have been working in India for many, many years. Dr. Suma is here from Shroff Hospital. She can tell you all about. Uh, she has, you know, had collaborations. And then, you know, there are always things that work dealing with two large bureaucracies, uh, United States government and Indian government is always a challenge. But, you know, we get things done. So uh, if you look at the international research program in just last, let's say, three years, um, it has gone from really developing and doing pro about 30 plus projects to close to 180 projects, programs all over the world. And we are working with closely 35 countries. So I don't want to claim this all happened because of, you know, a few people <laughs> like us. But it's, uh, it's definitely, there's a lot of passion involved here. Um, there's, uh, you know, and, and there's support from community from all over the world. Yes, sir. Anything else in there? Okay. All right. So our view of international research is that, you know, global science is very interconnected. Um, NEI is a National Eye Institute, is very actively involved in global research. Many programs, you just saw that, how that our graph, our numbers have gone up. Uh, we are looking to, we always look for scientific opportunities to identify shared priorities. We are working with the government of India on a shared priority. We are supporting unique international opportunities, supporting U.S. grantees to expand collaborations all over the world. We form partnerships, and here's the word, we, with the scientists, governments, companies, NGOs, and partnering and leveraging our expertise to work with all of you. So uh, in addition to granting and doing uh, granting money, funds, and all that, we also 
have a very important mandate is in terms of training. So you can look at that, you know, the current um, and, and National Institute of Postdoctoral Fellowship and where they are from, and you can see that after U.S., India literally stands out as number two. So you can imagine that in partnering, working with India is a, is a, is a big, big a part of our life. And we, we are not only training these people, but we are sending them back. Like you can see here, uh, close to 35 people have just come back to India with working with us. Three more minutes. So um, here, uh, the NGOs that uh, you can read all about it, and um, we, we, we see that you know, NGOs have very strong uh, working relationship with us. All those things what I tell you, you know, before we started the first slide. So I've already covered this slide. Yeah, clearly. So our next step essentially is to work with NGOs, you know, add additional training, building more research capabilities, and um, for providing bed to bench side research and bench to bedside, and that can all feed into each other. So um, here, um, I, I, this is one of my favorite quote from uh, uh, Dr. Suzanne Gilbert here. In addition to the prospect of enabling rapid engagement with the largest population, the NGO sector can play and you know on your side in, in building the capacity for research among service providers. So clearly all those examples are there, this country with the eye researchers, eye program, eye services are very used to working with international NGOs. They have made the ground very fertile for research for, for, for doing the next generation of things. So again, um, this would be my last slide actually. So NEI, international collaborations, uh, how they are important. This is my boss here, Dr. Paul Seaving, who directs the uh, National Eye Institute. And uh, clearly the questions that we are asking that where will we train the next generation of researchers to address major problems of global eye diseases? That's the question, right? Are there places in the world where we can actually get information and learn from on things like unusual exposures to toxins? I had gone to visit Chitrakoot and they told me that, you know, they see a lot of these, uh, um, you know, trauma cases uh, in that area and those were all, you know, you, you cannot find those kind of you know, research, anything related to, you cannot find the big number where you can actually do a validated research. So that's why it's important. Um, and uh, um, usually, you know, we see that, you know, every year, sometimes it becomes kind of, you know, s slow growth, but um, international collaboration and research publications have really gone up in the last many, many years. Uh, it really creates a great scientific excellence and uh, the publication uh, factors, the impact factors are considered really very, very, uh, you know, uh, highly rated. Uh, these are some of the programs that, you know, I was mentioning earlier that, you know, our collaborations, the U.S. collaborations in India. I just mentioned a few names. Some of you are sitting right here. Um, there are new programs that we have we've started, uh, you know, two big ones glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy that are happening right now. And we currently have applications open that will go on for the next uh, another two years until we bring the next program. So programs are available right now. If you have the, you know, I mean, the capacity, please uh, um, go to these, uh, the website and work something out. The last I want to mention is that uh, a new program called Global Eye Genetics Consortium that we've started. India is a big part of this. And we are honored to have uh, Dr. Takeshi Iwara, president of Global Eye Genetics Consortium, attending this uh, session. So he's right here. Please take a moment after this session to meet with Dr. Iwara. And, you know, there are lots of things that he can tell you about. So I want to thank you very much for, uh, uh, and we look forward to additional discussion here. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. So, um, we're, what we're going to do is have three presentations right now and then a Q&A. And, &A. and, and uh, the next speaker, once she can make her way through the chairs here, is Dr. Radhika Krishnan. Many of you know Radhika. She's CEO of Aditya Jodh Foundation for Twinkling <coughs> Little Eyes in Mumbai. It's a not-for-profit working in slums and tribal areas of Maharashtra for prevention of avoidable blindness. 
Foundation runs three eye care centers in the screens and treated more than 8 million people since its inception. Uh, so we're very delighted that in your role as uh, Chief Executive Officer, you can join with us today on how research comes about through strategic partnerships. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Susan, for that introduction. So taking on from where Dr. Uh, Gyan Prakash left, I would be uh, addressing more from the NGO perspective on why we need to have collaborative research. So uh, let me begin with what Kofi Annan said. I think this sort of summarizes what we need to do. And his concept is, in this global world, none of the critical issues that we are dealing with can be resolved within a solely national framework. And all of them require cooperation, partnership, burden sharing, and most importantly, he included NGOs in that framework of collaboration, both with governmental, NGOs, private sector, and civil society. So that's where we stand today. And my presentation, I would uh, talk about the intersection of NGO activity and research. Coming from my own background where we have been focusing mainly on activity, the entry into the research aspect of it was an eye-opener. And once we realize what it means, we are firmly going ahead with that. What NGOs can bring to the table, what the researchers contribute, the advantages of collaboration, and of course the challenges that face such collaborations, and moreover the strategies that we can work to promote and su sustain such partnerships. We all know that uh, NGOs are conventional agents of community development, successful, working closely with the community, and have made significant contribution, both in terms of resources, funds, and people. NGOs are activists. So they work on interventions, activities, implementation. These are the key words that the NGOs focus on. Whereas what do academic institutions and researchers bring? They bring about critical thinking, technical skills, credibility, and a long-term view that uh, many a time the activists lack. So these are NGOs are important partners, moreover working in uh, most uh, countries closely with the government uh, forces, but independent of the government, which is very important. They can be valued pa partners in health research for the development, right from concept creation to knowledge translation. And these are some of the benefits of NGO part partnership in research because each NGO brings with it the peculiar problems that are faced in that particular community that they work with, which needs to be addressed for overall national development and growth. They can contribute to the transfer of these research findings to the policy makers and thereby bring about actual translation on the ground. They can bring about community engagement and participation, which is key to any real development. The key strengths that an NGO brings on the table, resource mobilization, and uh, resource necessarily does not mean just funds. NGOs are capable of bringing in a lot of resources in kind, which is necessary for the success of any uh, translation in healthcare that is needed, promoting and advocating for relevant uh, health research, the generation, utilization, and management of knowledge and capacity development, they are also well-placed to foster public participation in decisions. They can provide mechanisms by which such participation is ensured in decision-making process. So as I was saying, the NGOs, because of their very nature of working closely with the community, can both identify problems and actually bring about translation when the research idea ideas bear results. While the researcher, on the other hand, they are theor theoretical, methodological, with technical expertise, skills and institutional support, and the funds to carry out research, the ability to uh, access skilled human resource, capacity and motivation to expand knowledge through publication of scientific results. The advantages are, of course, in front of you. Knowledge exchange, this happens while we train research students and also when we sit across the table to design a research project. Improved knowledge translation through increased collaboration with governmental organizations, then thereby help strengthen the long-term impact of such projects. 
they can increase the access to communities and policy makers. They can uh, help align these programs depending upon what the national policies on the ground are. They increase the acceptance of the community to such uh, projects. They can enhance the capacity building. The NGO research collaboration can increase the sustainability and beneficiary participation Funding, which is a problem for NGOs when it comes to research, because as most of us know, donors are actually interested in having something happening. What are you going to do for me on the field? What is going to be the impact of the project? How many beneficiaries are you going to touch? These are the key questions that most donors raise. And a research project cannot answer such questions. So it is necessary to think in terms of both what the actual implementation is going to be, beneficiary impact, at the same time, look at what the research question is going to address and how it is going to benefit the community in the long run. It provides support to data collection, which we all have realized is primary for bringing about any policy change. I would just take an example of a project that we are working on, that is the Ornet India study, which has been initiated by MRC UK. And there are a group of 20 NGOs that are participating in this, led by Shankar Netralya, Arvind, LV Prasad. This has led to bringing about 20 NGOs, bringing in their own capabilities, the ability to uh, bring about grassroots change. And the question that they're going to be answering is to evaluate the accuracy of various strategies for screening for diabetes and pre-diabetes. And hopefully the outcome will give crucial insight into the most cost-effective use of health resources and information about potential sources of cost reduction. The challenges, of course, any collaboration is not uh, without any challenge. There is an asymmetric power relation. The uh, researcher has this concept that I'm bringing in the ideas on table. I'm bringing in funds on the table for the research collaboration. While the NGO partner feels that we are the ones who are actually doing work on the ground. We are actually, one minute more. We are actually, uh, you know, bringing about the change or bringing about the results which the research question demands. So many a time, if there is not good understanding between the partners, this, this can be a source of power struggle. And uh, the lack of con uh, recognition of the contribution made by each uh, partner Divergent goals and approaches. As I was saying, we always face this. The donor comes and says, what is going to be your impact? How many lives are you going to affect? While the research question, while we were doing our diabetic retinopathy project, the question was about sampling. The research question demanded a very uh, selective sampling. Whereas the donor wanted to know, why are you not going to be taking the entire slum community which you're going to work on? Why are you going to only choose 1,500 people in that particular community? So this is again uh, a kind of issue that needs to be addressed in most research collaborations. But some ways are definitely there if you have all your ideas, all your thoughts on table, sit across with the research partner right from the concept stage so that the NGO partner can bring in their problems and decide the way forward. So these partnerships are characterized by trust. To conclude, these partnerships can make important contributions to global health research. It is important to identify the conditions and strategies that encourage their success. We need to work more to understand this very complex of this uh, complex partnership. And as I was saying, this is the uh, research project on diabetic retinopathy where we face these challenges between the NGO requirement and the research uh, requirement. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Radhika Ji. You really, I mean, asked a few questions that I thought, you know, we, we, we should discuss, uh, um, you know, after the talks are over. So now it's my great honor and pleasure to both to um, introduce you to uh, Dr. Suzanne, Suzanne Gilbert. And uh, Suzanne Ji is a very familiar name here. I was talking to some people yesterday and said, oh, I know her. So um, <laughs> I'm going to make it, again, informal as usual. She's really been working, as you know, for many, many years. Um, I'll always say the several decades. So, um, <laughs> But it really, she's been here for a long time. 
and uh, uh, they are all related to public health projects. Uh, she, as you know, she plays a very important role, key role, as the IAPB trustee and chairs their health work group, um, runs many programs in North America, and uh, has, uh, Dr. Gilbert had, uh, has many um, interests, many things that he has made contribution. And as I mentioned in my talk, she, uh, you know, contributed to a very, very uh, good chapter, which this all started here. And uh, uh, this was an advances in vision research. Dr. Takeshi Iwata and I uh, have this series going. We have produced two volumes so far. So it's my, again, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mm -hmm. Suzanne Gilbert here. Thank you so much, Gyanji. It's really great to be here today. And thank you. There are so many concurrent sessions, and they're all interesting. So we really appreciate the people with a research orientation and inquisitive minds who are here right now with us this morning. Thank you. I'm going to very briefly address a number of issues that build upon what Gyanji and, and also uh, Radhika also have, have covered. So when we're talking about why research, I thought that I would be speaking after our keynote speech on the, the GAP, the Global Action Plan uh, with WHO for the Prevention of Blindness, which would have pointed out uh, that we really ha cannot be complacent. As the Lancet articles brought out in the last few months, uh, we are, are projecting a tripling in the number of people who are blind and severely visually impaired between now and 2050 if we keep doing what we're doing. It's not enough. So the number of people in care are increasing. We know we have a human resource crunch. Uh, who needs to be brought into the workforce? Where? How? Uh, facilities are not enough in number and not productive enough. And we all know and we worry about inequity of services. Are they reaching everyone and with the quality required? When we are addressing research with NGOs, we're usually talking about three different classifications of, of research. More the community uh, population-based epidemiologic research, uh, operations research to better understand how are we doing in service delivery and how can we improve it. And finally, also clinical research to improve outcomes. As with any research skill building, we're largely talking about this cascade of intervention points to strengthen skill base. In first and foremost, defining the research problem, the area that no one gives sufficient uh, attention to, in my estimation, and then moving on through the other aspects of research. I want to point out especially the bottom line, which is applying results in publishing are extremely important uh, to make sure that we're using our research to actually improve practice re and reach more people. Um, I'm going to pass by this. Uh, I'll mention a couple of uh, studies that were done with active NGO support 40 years ago and 20 years ago. Uh, this uh, Nepal blindness survey, of which I was uh, involved in the design, implementation, and analysis, uh, was the first uh, comprehensive national survey of its kind. But beyond being a very uh, a useful opportunity to identify what were the uh, causes of blindness and how were they distributed across the country of Nepal, there also were a number of unintended positive effects of, of doing the survey, which since then, SEVA Foundation and many of our partners, many of this room, have adopted and built upon in the years since. And that is, as we're building the cotters, uh, the teams who are conducting research, take a look at then what can be the role of those people in the long term in the program. Uh, we found that uh, with the Nepal Blindness Survey, virtually everyone who was hired to be an enumerator in the very beginning was then asked to stay on and be trained as the first, uh, the first waves of ophthalmic assistance. So uh, we're always looking for unintended positive uh, benefits of research. Uh, another study from uh, 20 years ago was the Tibet Eye Care Assessment. Uh, everyone said it could not be done. It was accomplished. And uh, with active government effort as well as NGO effort, uh, we were able to pinpoint for the first time ever in Tibet uh, the, the, uh, the, these profiles of information that were then used to build the subsequent program. In 
operations research in a number of areas take a lot of pr prominence. Among them is certainly research on children. I'm just citing a small number of the hundreds of articles that have been produced in the last few years, many of them right here from India, and we're going to hear about some of those uh, in the next few minutes. Another area for operations research is how to improve the equity and cost of care. And, uh, and there have been uh, just a, a growing number of research teams addressing these issues so we can use our scarce resources wisely. There's also research on how do we go about scaling services, scaling service delivery processes that work. And uh, this study was developed based on work that a number of us in this room have done together over the past eight years. Uh, I'll just give one quick example from the AIDS Eye Initiative with which SEVA works with uh, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, we have been using while, while conducting a training program and service program, we've been studying the impact on offering uh, this uh, early intervention with CMV retinitis and the very positive impact this has had for patients now in seven countries around the world. Uh, it's resulting in uh, more papers being accepted. And finally now, valgentyclovir has been added to the WHO list of essential medications where it was not there before. When moving forward, when it comes to collaborative research, uh, I think a big purpose of this work is to simply kindle the awareness of the need for evidence. I mentioned in my opening remarks, we talk a lot about anecdotes and stories, but really we want to now move into being able to back up those anecdotes with actual data, really know how, how we're doing. We also need to build those research skills that then uh, that can be as basic as popularizing routine data collection and review that's done in all of our institutions every day. How many of us step back to even look at what we're doing and how we could do it better? Uh, we now know we ha need to prioritize research uh, on in high yield needs. And beyond publications is the huge arena of using the findings to improve service delivery. And I look forward to our talking about that when we come back to our second part of our session today. We're talking about four case studies having to do with um, applying research in the NGO setting. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Suzanne G. This is really good. I thought that, you know, if there are any questions on this first part before we move. So, you know, I mean, Dr. Gorgte is going to introduce folks, and um, and then we'll combine all the sessions. Is that right? Okay. Oh, oh, yes, and I have an invite to the next one. Uh, any questions on this so far? Yes, sir. Not the registration, but when you actually go and see the kind of program, they're so specific that it becomes next to impossible for small NGOs to use these grants. They're talking about cell biology research. They're talking about uh, you know, and the ones at the embassy were listed about bringing American delegations for literature festivals and that kind of stuff. So in the entire list, the whole exercise basically comes to a knot because as a small NGO, you do not have the research facilities to do what the NEI is looking at. And one of them was on a glaucoma research grant, which was to be given, but it was not clear whether to be done in Chicago or they wanted to study outside America. This was done by the NEI. So it's interesting to know that, you know, you need to desimplify this a little so that the smaller NGOs can also apply and gain from it. I think that's a very valid uh, question you raised, uh, Arunji, that's really, and thank you for raising that. And um, I, I'm, I'm actually going to refer to as whole session that Dr. Bala Subramanian and I are doing um, tomorrow afternoon. 
So there will be US Indo session on joint collaborative vision research. And all these issues have been, will be raised there. So I would like to extend my invitation to you to come there uh, so that we can discuss this in a lot more detail. Those things are all challenging. And as I said, we are dealing with two large set of bureaucracies. And our challenge is that you know we, we find our ways to navigate through it, okay? Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Good morning. I'm uh, Dr. Samla Chatterjee from um, Chhattisgarh, Raipur. So as uh, Dr. Shetty has already mentioned about smaller NGOs, again, another challenge that smaller NGOs face is that how to apply for these grants. Because most of us in our, uh, you know, in our career are never taught about all these things about approaching. And what we see even in India is that, you know, established institutes, of course, at one time, they would have also undergone that challenge. And they, the, the grants are actually, you know, uh, the, the distribution is not universal. It's, and one challenge that I feel is because the smaller NGOs, we don't have the capacity building in applying for these grants or a, a focus on how to go about it. So maybe some programs can be you know, generated where even the smaller NGOs can be called in and a kind of a, you know, uh, instruction kind of thing can be given how to go about this entire process. Maybe that's something that uh, the uh, Indian groups and the US groups can think about it. Again, a very good point, and I'm actually going to uh, have uh, Radhika ji. Uh, if I may just make a comment. So uh, we are a small NGO, and uh, we went through this entire process of dance, etc. So I know it's not going to happen the first time. We went in with the concept that, uh, you know, we need to make an attempt. So we've gone through the basics, and we finally did manage to submit a project. But f uh, fully aware that uh, you know it, it, there's a very high probability we are not going to make this. But uh, I think what we it was a big learning process uh, for us, and uh, uh, it also helped build a lot of rapport with our U.S. collaborators. And I think that goes a long way because I think uh, I mean the other panelists may agree. A lot of research happens because of, uh, you know, sitting across the table. It's more of a personalized friendship. So if you're able to even reach that level, I think eventually you will get there. So and that's what I think. So, so these kind of meetings where, you know, people can come across the table, because if you see most of the programs in India, they're all, uh, you know, either headed by people with a community fellowship degree uh, from either US or UK. They're in the panels, they're in the audience. And so the focus again and goes up. And as you are seeing the personal kind of things, so th what it's actually doing in India is it, it is uh, a lot of funds is coming. He's saying that 650 million uh, US dollars is, has been distributed internationally and a large chunk must have come in India. But the distribution is not equitable. There are some delegates from Northeast. I don't think anything is happening there. Central India, Chhattisgarh area, there's nothing because it's simply because we don't know how to go about it. Thank you. Uh, I think we can have the next speaker and we can have all the questions at the end so that we don't go through that time. work was done by me and the paper is written by somebody else. So you should be very clear with Tayari. This can be a joint authorship, this can be an individual authorship, this can be a senior or a uh, last authorship. So all that should be clear before you start. And uh, how will the IT be handled, which is more important actually. Because sometimes intellectual property rights are there and then uh, it should be very like how the IT will be shared between the two organizations. And 
they will preserve maintenance data for data. So data also like sometimes you give a limited access of certain data, you can give full access, who will have complete access, who will have partial access, how will the individual access the data, all that should be clear before even you start any consortium. Um, and increasingly collaborations must involve the institution, there should be material transfer agreement, IP and research compliance and conflict of interest, all this should be in place before even you start collaborations, um, if you before you move ahead. Uh, these are some of the elements of collaborations which should be uh, looked into and always collaboration is as Dr. Rao used to point out, uh, the institute was built with three T's, uh, that also is for collaboration, we require time, we require treasure, we require talent from all the people who are involved with this kind of thing. And uh, we should be very careful that it, it should not happen in collaboration where like we collaborate but we try to hide things from the collaborators. So if that happens then the integrity is lost, the uh, honest the transparency is lost and then I think the collaboration will not go a long way. Uh, I'll just give you an example of uh, one collaboration which is going almost like past 20 years, the Andhra Pradesh IDC study which started in year 1996 and Madhukar is there, he knows that how it started all that and uh, it was like initially Dr. Bansal went to Australia to get training in epidemiology and subsequently Lalit came back to India and then we asked Professor Hugh Taylor to help with the, the kind of study we wanted to do and it was that time that Hugh Taylor and uh, their group in uh, Sira and uh, Ali Prasad Institute collaborated and then subsequently it led to this kind of study where we had uh, data for 10,000 people across the world. They shared the questionnaires with us and they initially helped us in designing the whole thing. And it was Lalit from uh, uh, Hyderabad and then uh, Hugh Taylor from Sira Australia who were like initially involved with this kind of thing. I was just that time a fellow and uh, I was a pa privileged to be part of this study as a fellow doctor. Uh, this study uh, had led to number of publications, PhDs and all. I won't go into details of all that but it's one of the landmark study which we had done and this also laid the foundation of our eye health pyramid. Uh, the second study which was happened was like then we had a formal informal meeting in uh, uh, in uh, Argentina at IAPB General Assembly which was having hap happened in 2008. We had two, one is Global Site Initiative meeting which also went to different kind of collaborations and we went into uh, meeting with the ICH group to look at Andhra Pradesh IDC study whether it should be follow up and uh, GVS came with the idea, GV Murthy, Dr. GV Murthy came with the idea that we should go and look back whether these people are available also or not. That was a very good uh, suggestion and unless we would have collaborated, would have not even thought of all this actually. So that helped us and then we went ahead and uh, to find out whether these people are available or not and what we found was there was nobody available in urban area. So that gave us the insight that we should go in the rural areas we were where we found 70% of people are still available. So uh, we also have a couple of publications again from that uh, a simple tracing exercise which was finished in six months. And subsequently that laid the foundation of the third Andhra Pradesh IDC study three. Where, where we did the complete survey, we just finished uh, one year back and we are in the process of uh, two papers are almost getting ready for publications. And uh, uh, so this was like between ICH and Nelly Prasad Institute. I was involved from uh, the institute and uh, this was our team which was working on the ground here and this was the funding support. The funding came from different organizations across the world and these were our collaborators. Uh, then uh, recently, two years back, uh, we again, uh, Srinivas went for a postdoc fellowship at uh, Dana Center in Wilmara Institute and then he along with David came with the idea of doing uh, uh, assessment in the elderly population. There was no data on elderly population in, the, in, the, in India or any developing countries, mostly are from the developed countries and we don't have data. So David was, uh, came with that idea and we started doing it. And this study is, we have finished the part one of the study and we're going to start the part two. It is basically looking at uh, the, inter the, the issues in the elderly, in home for elderly in Hyderabad itself. So we have almost like there are a number of issues which are coming out and which is like sometimes mind boggling for us also we never thought of. Uh, the other collaboration what we have like it's a group collaboration which is Asian Eye and Epidemiology uh, Consortium which is a big consortium and their diff style of working is very different in this kind of consortium. Another is Global Burden of Disease, I won't go into details of Global Burden of Disease but uh, Asian Eye and Epidemiology Consortium con comprises number of studies across the world who came to across the especially the Asian regions which came across to share the data for uh, uh, getting some answers to some questions. 
and uh, why do we require this kind of consortium? Because sometimes one single st small study cannot give answers for many of the questions we want to answer. Uh, this will harmonize existing epidemiological data and create study repositories. Uh, we can make use of different resources for epi studies and develop new models for data imaging and specimen sharing. Uh, sometimes uncommon diseases can be uh, discussed, uh, answered with this consortium where you don't have enough power or enough sample in your data, but you can take data from others and club it and then probably come with a better answer. And these are some of the papers which came out of this consortium and they are very highly cited uh, papers across uh, in different uh, uh, regions. And this is how the consortium was formed. There is a steering committee which is uh, at the Singapore National Eye Institute. It was initiated by Singapore and we were involved to participate. And initially we were doing meta-analysis of sum, uh, using summary statistics from this data. And uh, uh, this is all the function of steering committee, look at overall research activities, solve issues of conflict. But steering committee doesn't mean that you will get authorship also. They just resolve many issues and uh, for authorship you have to be like a different kind of arrangement has to be made. And uh, so uh, this is how the some of the steps, I won't go into details of the step of the, like what happens if you want to do a meta-analysis, but uh, this is how we do. Uh, yeah, a small two or three groups uh, come with a question and then look at the data. And this is how authorship is shared. I won't go into details and how, uh, so this is about uh, the entirely about collaboration and it's very satisfying when all of us come together and come to answer some unanswered question and it's always a win-win situation for all of us. And I would acknowledge all the support from my team which I get in uh, Hyderabad as well as uh, I would also like to invite you for Vitathon which is happening uh, in May, it's a marathon, it's a, a, a kind of r r run which we are r trying to raise money for retinoblastoma. We did last year and almost like 64% of retinoblastoma patients were treated free of cast from that fund. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohit. And we have uh, Dr. Natarajan over here who is the, you can say, along with uh, Suzanne, one of the originators of the idea and who made this symposium possible. Thank you, and I apologize for coming late for the going to several places. But the originator of idea is uh, it happened in uh, uh, US when John was there. John, you can I come here. I, I was there. I just. Uh, I know. I, know, I heard that. Okay. So next speaker can talk. That's right. <laughs> and it happened in uh, uh, our friend's office, Victoria Sheffield. And unfortunately, she's not here, but I think uh, she connected us with Suzanne, and, and we are, this is only a beginning, and I think Suzanne is already working in India. We want to make sure, that's why my vision is one India, one vision, and one all India ophthalmic society. Thank you, Parikshit, for coming. You can call him up. Yeah. Uh, we have Dr. Narendran, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Arvinda Institute, Coimbatore. Dr. Narendran needs no introduction. He has done phenomenal work in all the retina aspects of community eye health and of course in the retinopathy of prematurity project. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Parikshit. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Gyan Prakash, Dr. Susan, for giving us an opportunity to present our telescreening project for ROP, the ROP SOS, which was started with funding by USAID. When we, why we thought of a telescreening project for ROP? Because we all know that India has the highest number of premature births in the world. In the year 2005, the, the government of India, uh, under its National Rural Health Mission, wanted to start a neonatal unit in all the district headquarters hospitals. And today, we have a little more than 700 government neonatal units to be operational in India. Moreover, apart from this, we have at least five to 15 in each of the districts which come under the private sector. So with all this improvement in neonatal care, many of these preterm babies su uh, survive even in rural areas. And this has led to an increase in the incidence of ROP. But the ground reality is the awareness of ROP is low. And although, many, although there are uh, uh, trained ROP screening experts, but they are available only in the urban areas and they are non-existent in the rural areas. Thus, there is a lacuna for providing ROP screening in these areas. 
So this led to the uh, birth of ROPE SOS, which was a telescreening project uh, and which was funded by USAID, which stands for United States Agency for International Development. When we started this, the aim of the project was to screen, we started it in the year 2015, and the aim was to screen 2,000 babies per year by doing ROP screening in the underserved and rural areas. And the team used to consist of two managers, two trained technicians, one mid-level ophthalmic assistant and a driver. And we covered neonatal units in nine districts of our state of Tamil Nadu and neighboring state of Kerala. We uh, targeted 200 kilometer radius from our base hospital at Coimbatore, covering Tamil Nadu and Kerala. And we had a memorandum of understanding with 53 neonatal units, including government hospitals. So in every week, we cover the two states of Tamil Nadu and Kerala, covering nine districts, 18 towns, and 56 neonatal units. And the infrastructure used to consist of a red camp shuttle. And the technicians were trained in two phases, wherein in the first phase they were uh, trained with using a red cam image practice kit. And in the second phase, they were uh, trained on babies under the supervision of a pediatric retina specialist. We also uh, procured a van to carry the red cam machine and the uh, diode laser, laser machine. And the van had facilities wherein they can uh, do a laser in the van itself. And the images that were captured were transferred uh, uh, using the modified address software for ROP, which, we mo uh, which was initially developed for diabetic retinopathy, but we modified it for ROP. And the connectivity was through broadband internet, which was uh, very cost effective. And the central server was installed at the base hospital. We also used this opportunity to ca uh, capture anti-segment images so that we could do a comprehensive eye screening. So as far as the continuum of care, the team will leave the base hospital in a van along with the red camp shuttle, go to the neonatal units. The ROP screening will be done using the red camp by the a trained technician. And then the digital images will be loaded onto the and transferred to the base hospital where the images will be graded by a ROP expert and the report will be transmitted back to the neonatal units. If the child needs a laser, it, uh, the uh, laser will be done on the day by sending in a uh, retina specialist or within, uh, by the, uh, within 24 hours. Also, the most important thing is the advice is given to the family regarding the next follow-up, the, the, thereby doing a good counseling. So we started in the uh, month of August 2015, and by January 2019, we had screened close to 17,224 babies, wherein uh, 23%, that is th uh, the 3,974, had some stage of ROP. 305 babies were treated, where uh, 132 received intravitreal bevacizumab, uh, three received intravitreal ranuzumab, and 167 babies received laser treatment. We also, in this uh, program, developed multicolor ROP information posters and uh, brochures, which, which were given as handouts to all the uh, parents. We also developed an SMS software where a periodic reminder is being sent to the parents because uh, the, I think the uh, cell phone penetration today in India is close to 100%. So all, all the parents have access to a mobile phone, so we do send in a uh, SMS. Also, in this, we had continuing medical education programs where we had sensitized 711 neonatal staff on the importance of ROP screening. We also sensitized them on the importance of using blenders because uh, many of these neonatal units were not using blenders. And we, after that, we had seen a drastic drop of aggressive posterior ROP from these neonatal units. This is one example of AP ROP, wherein the, uh, uh, it was an infant with a gestational age of 36 weeks at the birth weight of 1,800 grams which would have normally fall, would have fallen outside the NNF guidelines, 
but had developed an APROP. So the impact of this was more parents do demand eye evaluation of the newborn. And also, at the same time, more healthcare providers, the pediatricians especially, will refer the premature babies on time. And more ophthalmologists will be interested to get trained in ROP screening and management due to increased referrals and demand. This is just to show the, how the volume of uh, in our pediatric retina unit increased over a course of time. In the, we started a separate pediatric retina unit in the year 2011, and after that you can see the growth. And in the year 2015, we started the mobile uh, uh, screening, and the, uh, we grew almost threefold in a course of five years. Also, this project helped us to uh, the seeing the uh, success of this. We duplicated this. And we right now have two teams going to two different areas every day. Also, we want to replicate the, this model across all our hospital branches so that we could cover the entire states of Tamil Nadu, Kerala, with adjoining parts of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Also, I w uh, we at this time, we have uh, also submitted a proposal to the National Eye Institute along with a group from uh, uh, P, uh, headed by Dr. Pete Campbell on the on the, the, uh, uh, automated reading for ROP because we do have the database. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, may I request our last speaker for the day, and then we'll have question and answers. Doctor Subhish Koyadel is. A young enthusiastic ophthalmologist from no, Chitrakoot. I'm sorry, I'm not an ophthalmologist. You're not wrong. Okay. Okay. So okay. Uh, just to that, <laughs> yes, I mean he's done his uh, community ophthalmology public health from LSHTN. Yes, sir. Yeah. So please, uh, with your Chitrakoot model. Thank you, sir, for uh, that uh, nice introduction. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gyan Prakash, sir, Madam, and uh, Natarajan, for, sir, for this great opportunity. I'm fortunate and uh, very privileged to be in this platform and talking about collaborative research in community ophthalmology with a specific emphasis on the need of health system research. So when you talk about collaboration, it's all about synergy, that we come together to achieve more. And when in terms of collaborative research, it is definitely going to be fruitful as uh, multiple scientific mind work together and encourage great creativity. So. When we talk about community op ophthalmology, it, it cannot exit without collaboration because you look community as a whole rather than a, a patient perspective. So in very brief, I wanted to discuss what is its relevance in today's context and are there any some good work which we can get inspired and how do we leverage its full potential? So this slide very clearly shares that in spite of the, all the good works we do, there is a huge burden on us that we need, like Dr. Sosen also mentioning about that, there is a lot of things to be done. It clearly indicates that collaboration is much more required. So I'm slightly coming to India and uh, just want to emphasize on two things that how do we tackle uh, the current diseases in India? I, I just want to give you four examples. Diabetic eye disease, in spite of the growth and becoming a capital of diabetes, we do not have a national level policy to tackle diabetic retinopathy. Even government have an NCD program which have no mentioning about diabetic retinopathy. Similarly on presbyopia, which clearly emphasizing there is a huge economic burden and studies even from India, like there is a recent study which on tea pickers, which clearly showing it has a huge impact on productivity, but still we don't have a national level program. And I just want to show you another one, Dr. Narendra sir has clearly explained about ROP and the problem. If we have the largest preterm birth and in spite of having a national policy, research is showing that more than 75% of infants who present with stage 5 ROP to a large tertiary eye grain should have never be screened for ROP. So two programs have shown you there is no national level program, but in ROP we do have a program, but nothing is happening in the field. Similarly, if you look at children eye health, we've been working on, and 1994 onwards we had a school eye health screening program. But what is happening in the ground? Recently, we had two programs, one is with USAID and also with OBIS. 99% of the school we have screened, they had never had a screening program. 
So in spite of having policy, nothing is happening in the ground. So why this? If you look at the relevance of research, research is required, evidence is required for identification, which leads to policy formation. Again, you need evidence so that program will be developed. And again, you need research for program implementation. I think this area, we do not have nothing. Just as an example, I want to show you, we have done a lot of things in CATRACT. And in 2012, there was a literature review which they searched for factors enabling or constraining universal coverage of CATRACT services. But unfortunately, they couldn't find anything, which shows that in the ground level, how do thi take things happen? Just an example I want to show you. We have a beautiful diabetic eye, eye screening program of NHS, which is very clear. And can we take into India? No. If you look at other research, which says that when you have a program, the existing health system has not having enough capacity to handle that, the result is going to be vague. So when I talk about health system research, when I talk about in a program impl implementation, it needs collaboration. If you look at school screening program it itself again, you need a large level of collaboration. Even still it is happening, but the focus is on not on the evidence creation. So we need to work collaboratively and bring practical evidence to solve the problem, as it is mentioned. It's not only I'm saying, if you look at the re recent report by Public Health Foundation India and the Queen Elizabeth, they o their rec major recommendation again, close partnership and working along with the health system so that diabetic retinopathy can be tackled. So the lack bottleneck is we don't have a research culture. Being like organization like Chitra, we do 130,000 surgery. But the number of papers, if you look at it's not to the mark. So that culture we have to bring in because many of the time our priority is service delivery. And we don't, even between eye care organizations, we don't have a collaboration in that much. Definitely it is coming forward. And uh, integration is not happening. So just quickly I'll go for some example. If you look at WASH and health working together, water, sanitation, and hygiene, and non-tropical disease like onchocerciasis and trachoma, they're working together. They, they, real, they realize that that collaboration only can tackle the program. Similarly, ROP in India, there is a program is coming up so that the program ROP also can be taken. And again, the health system integration. There are researchers which showing that integrating healthcare to the primary eye care can bring a lot of change. Similarly, like there are a lot of consortium. I purposely not put the Asian Genesis Consortium because definitely Dr. Ganser has detailed explained about that. Similar like Commonwealth Eye Health Consortium you have. A lot of uh, institute like Brain Hold and bring us a lot of research, surveys and all. So just want to conclude with this. If you look at School Eye Health, now we have a scenario where as an eye care organizer, you talk about directly children which have reduced participation, acceptance problem. You do have a school screening program which have a compliance problem. But if you really increase your spectrum, I'm very sure that all this problem will go away, which is a right requirement for, for all of us. So I leave with the message that I think this has a greater knowledge. We as an NGO, we do a lot of work. We go and solve the problem and we stop there. We don't circulate it. We have a lot of economical and sustainable model we created in India across, but we never look that aspect into research. I, I truly believe that collaboration should come in and practical model we should develop so that people can replicate in their own area and utilize it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> microphone, microphone. Thank, thank you, Subesh. And I think you can be here in the front for some. I think we have about eight minutes eight minutes to discuss and I'm glad uh, you touched a uh, lot of points which uh, it is like uh, touching you like uh, stimulating the fire we can probably will come here or there John okay no you can be there in the mic so that you can comment from there on the opposite side so Karthik you can be there on the opposite side so it's easier so anyhow Suvesh uh, you touched a lot of points I only wanted to highlight here the uh, the main reason uh, Dr. Takeshi, Dr. Jan Prakash and many others, we have 104 faculty uh, from uh, all over the world here. And we have, I think all the continents are rep represented, but I think uh, because I knew that I'm going to be a president uh, two years back, so I'm interacting with uh, John for uh, long, for what can we do together in India? And, and that's how we went to Victoria Sheffield's office. I, Victoria Sheffield is the uh, chief of uh, International Eye Foundation where she's also working in India through our friend's name. What's his name? Oh, from Madurai, he's there. Uh, uh, Victoria's associate. What's his name, Dr. Radhika, who came to move? Huh? Uh, Rahim. Rahim, Rahim uh, is from Madurai, and Rahim's mother has worked with Dr. Venkat Sami, and uh, 
Dr. Venkat Swami. And uh, so I think uh, it's a great opportunity where we were wondering how can we mix uh, the community eye health with the uh, research. And I wanted to highlight, we have made an MOU between two institutions, that is uh, Ayatha Jyoti Foundation and, uh, and I'm sure Ilesh is here and, uh, no, uh, sorry. Dr. Alok Sen. Uh, Alok Sen is here. And uh, I think Ilesh is, so I've taken an opportunity to invite on behalf of Global Eye Genetic Consortium for a meeting. We have the president, Dr. Takeshi here, Ibata sitting here, a meeting on 18th evening and 19th in uh, Mumbai. Uh, I know, five minutes more, thank you. <laughs> so we have five minutes, 300 seconds. So the, uh, uh, the what I want to inform is Subesh, and uh, I don't know whether, I, I, I'm sure Ilesh is coming, and uh, Ilesh is talking, and uh, we want you yes, and uh, Alok to come to Mumbai yes, on 18th, uh, 18th morning and be on the city tour, on the walking tour in the slums sure. with John and uh, Takeshi is going to, to be Skype. The reason I'm mentioning this is Dr. Umang Mathur conducted the uh, Global IG, uh, Eye Genetic Consortium. Now the AGC has become GGC. And uh, Dr. Jan Prakash is the uh, chairman, uh, the pa patron. So the sure. reason I'm mentioning all this is I already went and met the government of India health minister thanks to the stimulation by Jan Prakash because uh, Jan Prakash keeps talking often and I think always I feel that I'm in the US or and I'm in India. Because every time he'll say, and then I think that gives me idea. So I went and met uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Nadda, the JP Nadda, the Union Minister for Health, the Director General of Health Services, and I told this, and I'm, I'm also now fortunately close with Mr. Ratan Tata, who's supporting the NCD in the Government of India. So we have five NCD, diabetes, hypertension, oral cancer, cervical cancer, and breast cancer. For the three cancers, the Tata Trust is uh, supporting the uh, tele, med, uh, tele uh, uh, what do you call, radiology. So I have suggested to them had diabetic retinopathy as the sixth one, which is a m mammoth task, and I think there are a lot of plans going on in the government. They have not still uh, made it. So fortunately, under All India Ophthalmic Society, we have made a committee, and I'm chairing it, which I'm going to announce today in the uh, inaugural function, along with Dr. Ajit Babu, Dr. Kim, Dr. Rajiv Raman is uh, not here. And uh, um, so we want to work all over India, and we are sure. calling the program screening through teleophthalmology to prevent diabetic blindness. And the extension will be, we are going to work and already on Ornate India, we are working on unique population yes. when uh, we are working in uh, with the slums, right, Dr. Radhika? And uh, you are working with the- Saints. Uh, in Saints. the Saints. Uh, so I'm happy to say All India Ophthalmic Society has initiated a diabetic retinal screening in Kumbh Mela already with the Dr. UP Society, U UP State Society. And I'm formalizing it, and we need publications. Wonderful. So the entire idea of collecting all of you is we need collaboration, and the collaboration has to be wor working, implemented, and finally published. And Gyan is uh, uh, given is uh, go ahead that if it's a p uh, the work is good, he'll be a part of the paper. So sure. with this, uh, Gyan, to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Natarajan. It's it's a great honor and pleasure. But this has been going on for for uh, for, for for a while, and seeing a full room here is just uh, it's just tremendous uh, you know uh, honor that there's a lot of interest i just want to uh, give just two points which is number one is that dr natarajan and i have talked about that can we combine the effort of effort of all of you and just have a multi pi multi center sort of approach if you all start cooking your own food and you know, I'm, without going into detail, then it's just going to be so o overwhelming. You're going to miss the dunce number you, that Arun Sethi mentioned earlier. You're going to miss so many other things. But if you combine your effort and perhaps have one or two sort of will not be in play, and you're going to succeed. So that's just one thing. Second thing, I want to address this, the whole Indo-US program, a lot more in detail. Dr. Bala Subramaniam, who's coming tomorrow morning, he and I will, and he's literally the founder of the Indo side of this uh, whole collaboration. 
he and I will co-chair the session tomorrow afternoon. So please come over there if you have any, if you are interested, and we're going to get into all the details. So, thanks. Well, I would like to add one thing. A number of us in the room are members of the organization, the International Society for Geographic and Epidemiologic Ophthalmology. And this is an organization dedicated to sharing information about how to go about doing community research and also making sure that that work is done at a particular level of quality that it can be published. We have our own journal, as you may know, Ophthalmic Epidemiology, which is a very good go-to journal. So I do want to put in a plug, and this session is co-sponsored in collaboration with the International Society for Geographic and Epidemiologic Ophthalmology, of which I'm president and uh, Parikshit is secretary. So we're very happy to be part of this session. So thanks all the chairs, co-chairs, moderators, and the speakers. Thank you very much, and we are finishing in time. Thank you.